for coming. Uh, sorry I'm between you and lunch and I'm going to talk about uh, boring business stuff, so uh, we'll try and keep it lively a little bit. Uh, my name is Walt Powell. My title is Lead Field CISO. So I'm a recovering CISO who leads a team of recovering CISOs who talk to CISOs about their problems because we got tired of having real responsibilities and thought it would be more fun to talk to people about their problems. As part of that, we talk to dozens and dozens of CISOs and we've seen how programs work well and how programs work poorly and as part of that I've seen lots and lots of board decks and lots of ways that CISOs present their programs to the business and most of them do it very poorly. Do we have anybody in here who leads a security program? Anybody actually have the CISO title? Yeah. Um, of you who have the CISO title, any of you actually get to report to the board? This is the problem. Um, any of you have somebody else report to the board on your behalf? Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> this is a very, very common problem. And part of the reason that that is and that we're seen as these like second class C levels and we don't get to report directly to the board is because we have poor messaging. Um, we don't do a good job of telling our story. We're not good ambassadors for ourselves. What ends up happening, imagine if a CFO walked into the business and said, we can't really tell you exactly what our earnings were this month in the terms of dollars, but we can show you a red, yellow, green that tells you that it went up. We don't really know where all our assets are, but we kind of have a good idea where our assets might kind of be, right? Um, we, we don't really, like, know what's going on, but I can tell you the accounts receivable team is killing it. They did 45,000 receivables this month and they had a mean time to close of four hours. That's what we're doing when we're going in and telling the story. And that's a terrible story. They would get laughed out of the boardroom and they would immediately be voted out of their job. And so that's what we can't be doing. You can take a picture of this slide and then you can go to lunch because this is the whole thing. If you want to stick around and figure out how to do this, then we'll talk about that a little bit. But this is the whole thing. We need to understand what the boards and the directors and the executives need from us. We need to be able to tell the story in the terms of dollars. We need to be good translators of our security terms into business terms. Message that. Tell that in the terms of an actual story and tell the right story to the right people and that's the whole thing. So the first thing is we got to understand who we're talking to. So Businesses have these boards of directors. And who are these boards of directors? Well, they are people who represent the owners. And generally, when we think of boards, we're thinking of public companies, right? Um, but that's not always the case. Boards just represent the owners. Nonprofits, NGOs have these boards. Um, private companies often have these boards. And we'll talk about a famous court case here in a minute about a private company's board. But generally, we're talking about public companies. And they uh, are representing the shareholders, right? And they have a fiduciary duty to the owners, meaning they owe them a duty, a set of duties. The first is a duty of care, and the duty of care says uh, we have to make sure that we are not letting other people come to harm that was foreseeable. The duty of loyalty says I have to act in the best interest of the company in good faith and not self-deal. Duty of obedience says I have to follow all the laws. So if I run like a trucking company, for instance, even though it would be more profitable for me to tell my drivers to speed because we would get more stuff more places faster, that would be breaking the law and I can't write a policy that says you have to speed, right? So I owe these duties. Well, what happens if I don't, right? Like what if I just say forget that, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Well, the owners can sue you. Like, if you break the law, you could be held criminally liable, but the owners can sue you directly as a board member, and that's what they're trying to avoid. That's what they care about, is upholding these duties and not getting sued personally. However, it's very hard to make the case that you're going to get sued because they have this business judgment rule. As long as you acted in good faith and you showed your duty of loyalty and were a person of reasonable prudence. So reasonable legally means like a normal, reasonably intelligent adult of normal caution. But prudence means that you understood the risks and took them into account when you were decision making. And that is very important because it means you have to pay attention to the risks and you have to understand them and you have to have paid attention to them. So these court cases are known as care mark cases, right? Because the first one was the care mark company who's the insurance company who does pharmaceutical insurance and stuff now. I have them, they suck. Um, that first case, uh, their board sued them and 
what came out of this was this idea that if you aren't keeping up your duties, that you can be sued directly as a board member. The next one was Bluebell ice cream. Bluebell ice cream kept having this situation where they were poisoning people with food poisoning because they had such terrible controls. This was a private company. The private owners sued their board because they didn't have good controls in place to keep from poisoning people. And that's where the idea of reasonableness and breach of loyalty came from. The next one was Boeing. Those planes were crashing, right? This is where the idea of mission criticality came in. Even though they have all these different lines of business where the ice cream people just had one line of business, you have to pay attention to things that are mission critical. Then there was a case called Sorensen versus the firemen that said cybersecurity is mission critical. Hypothetically, because that case got thrown out and so they never actually had to hold anybody account for cybersecurity, but hypothetically, cybersecurity is mission critical. However, when solar winds came along, they didn't hold the solar winds people to account. Even though cybersecurity was the whole bag there, they never had any meetings in their board about cybersecurity, but they did have it in a subcommittee, so they decided trying is good enough. However, the McDonald's case, like McDonald's hamburgers, uh, they decided that this duty doesn't just apply to board directors, it also applies to managers and executives and stuff. They had a human resources officer who uh, didn't take uh, SA stuff into high enough account, right? Um, so what they decided was it's really managers who are responsible for execution and it's just board directors who are accountable for oversight. The SEC came to the same conclusion. So the SEC put out these rules and in the proposed rules, we were gonna make the boards have to have cybersecurity expertise and they were gonna be held to account for this and then they chickened out. And what they ended up with and what they said in the final draft of the rule was boards have oversight, executives do the execution. So our boards, vision, oversight, governance, that's what they care about, that's what they need, and then executives do the execution. So the, ex so the executives have to report to the boards, tell them what's going on, and the board's job is to understand and consume that, and they have to do it on a fairly regular basis. So that's what your board is, that's what they need from you. They need to understand the risks, and you need to be able to talk to them in their language. So what is their language, right? You've probably heard, align your program to the business, speak the language of the business, but nobody ever tells you how to do that, right? Well, let's fix that. So there are four languages of the business, accounting, finance, economics, and risk, right? So accounting is all that uh, income sheet, balance sheet, cash flow statements, those types of things that are in accounting. You should be able to read those. You don't need to go get an MBA. You can go study it in 15 minutes online and figure out how to read an income sheet. It's pretty easy. Um, Finance is valuations, like what is your company worth, how is it valued, how is it valued on the stock market, it's about projections and how do we do capital allocation. Economics is all that uh, supply and demand inflation type of stuff, and risk, this is a place that's right in our wheelhouse, this is what we care about and you think we would be really great at this, but this risk is business risk, not IT risk, and this is where folks get it wrong a lot. So the first part of this is talking in their value language, in their money language, right? So we have to understand what determines value for your business, right? How is value created? How is it made? Is it for stockholders? Is it for partners? Where is value delivered? Is it in the stock price? Is it in creating dividends? Is it in uh, capital appreciation? Is it uh, assets? Where do we make this value? Go make your CFO your best friend and find out the answers to these questions because you can align your program to these things and you can speak their language. It's pretty easy to do once you understand what their language is and how the things that they're shooting for. Is it about earnings per share? Is it about EBITDA? Is it about capitalized growth annually? What is it they're trying to hit? You can then help them hit it and align your thing that you're doing to the thing they're talking about. If their goal is capitalized growth and you're talking about we're hitting 45,000 vulnerabilities closed per month, they don't care about that. They care about capitalized growth, right? Risk. This is the place where we're supposed to be awesome at communicating. We're terrible at communicating about it because when we go to talk to the board, we're talking about 
risks all in the wrong way. Because they have all these risks, and our risk is the tiniest little part of it. They're worried about talent management. They're worried about uh, liquidity risk. They're worried about uh, economic on global scale risk. They're worried about how they're going to pay dividends. They're worried about health and safety. They're worried about price competition. They're worried about all these other things, and your little IT risk is just part of that. And when you go into the board meeting, they've been listening to all these other risks all day, and they're trying to figure out where are we going to invest our money. And you're just another person coming in saying, like, invest your money over here, right? But a lot of the other things that they were trying to invest their money in are things that are going to make them money, and you're probably not going to make them money, right? So, like, what's the case for you to go, say, invest your money over here? If you're talking about risk, you should be talking about it in one of these terms. And if you're not using one of these terms, you're probably communicating it wrong to the business because these are business risks, right? Financial, operational, regulatory compliance, legal, reputational, strategic, health and safety. If you said any other term, it's probably wrong, right? That's, these are the risks that businesses care about. The other thing that happens a lot is folks in security confuse the idea of risk and threat and exposure. And I see this all the time. People create a risk register, and they put a bunch of stuff on the risk register that are not risks. They will say, OK, here's my risk register. My biggest risk is ransomware. My second biggest risk is unpatched OSs. My third biggest risk is, I don't know, fill in some other thing. Right? Both, neither one of those things are risks. Like we just said what risks are. Risks are things that cause harm. Risks are things that have a probability and an impact. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, you should be able to use them to make an informed decision. Um, and the way that you treat risk is you have a handful of choices. You can avoid it. Stop doing the thing that you would do to have the risk happen to you. You can transfer it to somebody else, like get insurance and have somebody else take on that risk. You can reduce it, mitigate it. You can get a control by a firewall or whatever. Or you can accept it and say, whatever, we're just going to take that risk on. Those are your choices, right? The other things are threats. Threat is the thing that is the actor that could potentially cause the harm. That would be like the ransomware group. Or an exposure is the vulnerability that could lead to the threat doing the thing to us, which would be like those unpatched operating systems, right? These are two different ideas. If you look at the way that FAIR or like your uh, ICS, CISSP defines risk, risk is likelihood times impact. And if you look at how FAIR decomposes likelihood, likelihood is threat times vulnerability. So when I'm talking about threats or vulnerabilities in terms of risk, I'm only telling half the story. And the half of the story that I'm leaving out is the impact. And the impact is the so what. It's the who cares. It's the what the business gives a crap about, right? Is the impact to the business. And so when I come in here and say my risk is ransomware, I miss the whole so what, and that's why they don't care. The other reason they don't care is because I come in here and I take these risks and I put them in this thing. You guys have probably seen this thing, right? This is a pretty typical risk matrix. NIST tells you to put it in a risk matrix like this. Like, NIST is the government. Why would you not listen to the government? They tell you to do this. Well, this sucks. So let's talk about why this sucks. So this is what's called ordinal meaning in order, right? Low, medium, high. They went with five things here. Low, medium, high, medium, medium, high, medium, whatever. It still sucks. Like, okay, uh, how are these things different? Because how is a three by five and a five by five? Those are the same. So are they really the same? Like, how much different are they? How, what would I have to do to move a five by five to a three by five? If I have 30 highs and 50, and 50 mediums and 100 lows, am I better off to fix one high or 15 mediums? Who knows? It doesn't tell me any of that. It doesn't give me any kind of granularity. It doesn't give me any kind of accuracy. I can't do any math against this. It doesn't help me tell the story. So let's take a look at some people's real board slides. So these are people's real board slides that they've showed to their real boards. I've changed the names so that we're not being totally mean to people, but I'm going to show you things that people have shown their actual boards. This one came from a big name, like one of the big names that you pay millions of dollars to for advisory services, like one of those big names, like the accounting firm big names came up with this. They paid millions of dollars for this piece of crap. All right. So... If we look at this, we'll see that R1 and R4 are their very highs, right? 
However, they're not the highest on likelihood. One of them is the highest on impact. One of them is not. The things that are the highest on likelihood are only highs, so why is that? Even though this one is the highest on likelihood or on impact and this one's not, they're the same. So how are they the same? What does this mean? How would I make this one be the same as that? Like, this doesn't make any sense. This is stupid. Um, also, it doesn't tell me anything about how do I prioritize this or what do I do about it. Additionally, um, they're pretty close with what's an actual risk. Loss or alteration of intellectual property is actually a risk. So they're on to something there at least. Let's take a look at this one and I'm going to throw it out to you guys. This is a super common board slide. Like, I see this all the time. This is a good risk register. When I show this to people, people are like, this is awesome. Give me this slide. I'll give me this as a template. What do you think about this? What do you like? What do you not like? Anything you jumps out at you is like, that's not cool? Just shout it out. Ah, yeah, that's not even my problem with it. That's probably also true. But let's start off with, are these even risks? No. Data exfiltration, not a risk. Malware, not a risk. Virus outbreak, not a risk. Exploit, not a risk. Spear phishing, not a risk. None of those things are a risk. If we look at the description, at least they start getting closer. Loss of intellectual property or damage to the brand, that's, that's almost a risk, right? How about when we look over here in the likelihood and impacts? Again, they went ordinal. High, medium, high, medium, high, medium, high, medium, high, medium. Are these all really the same? Is social media, like somebody posts something bad about you on social media, really the same as spear phishing? Is that really the same as a virus outbreak? Are those the same? I don't know, maybe. But if they are, how did they come up with this prioritization? Did they come up with this prioritization based on mitigation complexity? Well, if so, that's stupid too because they got malware and virus outbreak. How would we mitigate those? Like probably some kind of endpoint, EDR, EPP, right? Like I can go by CrowdStrike, that's super easy. The first one that's the same complexity is data exfiltration. I mean, the DLP and data classification and discovery and data governance, I think it's the hardest thing you can do. Like as a CISO resume generator, they have it the same difficulty as like buying CrowdStrike. This is stupid. I, this is like one of the worst slides I've ever seen. How about this? You see this all the time. This is how many open incidents we have. We got our mean time to close down. Here are our risks, right? Like this leads me to my next point. Stop sharing operational metrics with your board. Just don't do it. There's no reason for them to see it. They don't need to see these operational metrics. We need to be telling them the story in their terms. So KPIs versus KRIs. KPIs are performance indicators for you to see how your program is performing. KRIs are risk indicators for you to talk about how risk is made in your business, right? Here's a real world example. The company came to us and said, hey, we're trying to tune up our KRIs. Can you help us? We took a stab at it. We had these KRIs and we turned them into these KRIs. Turns out neither one of them were KRIs. They started off with, we have a bunch of outgoing emails that are unprotected, and we have a bunch of incoming emails that are full of malware. And they changed that to, we have a bunch of automated outgoing emails and outgoing manifests, and they just decomposed it into like crazier numbers. And then they went with the number that we blocked versus the number that we detected of incoming bad stuff. But still, who cares? These are operational metrics. They took a KPI and they made more KPIs. What they needed to do was create a KRI. And one of the easiest ways to do that is just to take your KPI and create a target, right? Like, this was our goal, and this is what we achieved toward our goal, and just turn it into a percentage instead of a number, right? Like, we wanted to block X amount, we blocked 40% of all of the ones that came in. We blocked 60% of all of the ones that came in. Now we're starting to get close to something that could be a business metric, right? Additionally, on those ones that are, we were sending out emails that had sensitive information in them, I can start to quantify this very easily. I can just go out and take a look at what uh, uh, Ponymon says is the cost per breach record and apply cost per reach, breach by number of records and say, okay, we had a 40% reduction in 150,000 emails at 60,000 emails at $160 per record. I saved you $9.6 million in breach exposure. That is a KRI. Boom. I turned it into a dollar figure that's I saved you $9.6 million versus we blocked 150,000 
bad emails, which still sounds bad, right? How about this slide? This was another real world one that uh, I was actually given as an example by a guy who was teaching CISOs how to be good CISOs. Um, never do this. So this is like, not only did he show like all these tools, but he like left ones that he didn't intend to fill in. We don't have time to talk about it, but. So let's talk a little bit about what good looks like. First, you've got to start by understanding the assignment. What are you there to do? You're there to educate, to inform, to explain to them what the risks are, to report to them what the business risks are, to update them on what's happened. One of the most important things you're there to do is to instill confidence. The board's, one of the board's main jobs are to determine who the executives are and to hire and fire executives, C-level employees. So they're there to determine who's good for that job. And one of the things that you're there to do is to prove that you're the guy for the job. And it's one of the main things you're there to do. So make sure that you're doing that. And then to demonstrate that you're doing your fiduciary duty and you're demonstrating your loyalty. You need to do that by telling a story. Go in and have a story arc to what it is you're trying to explain. Understand your audience. Make sure you're telling the right story to the right people. And then engaging stories that have a story path. Make sure that you, like, TED Talk slides, minimalist slides, super clean, on brand. Go to your marketing department. Have your marketing department help you with your slides. Keep them super on company brand, like super clean. You saw me do this at the front. The old bluff stole this from the military. Tell them in the first 30 seconds what is the key takeaways. Like, here are the things you need to care about so when they tune out and stop listening to you after 30 seconds that you got a point, across the point you need to get across. Make sure that you're telling the right story to the right audience. The board is not who you go beg for money. The executive leadership team or your, uh, your committee or whoever it is, board or budget time, that's who you go beg for money. You don't go hat in hand to your board to beg for money. Your board is who you get buy-in from. It's who you build confidence with. It's who you report the risk to. What you need to explain to the board is how I spent your money, what you got for your money, how that measures up to the expectations I set for you last time, what is our current risk exposure, what's my plan to deal with that, what can you expect in, as the return on that plan, and why I made that particular decision. You need to do all of that in 15 minutes without getting sidetracked because they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and try and take you off track. The executive management team, that's where you get budget. You need buy-in from them too. This is where you explain deeper risks and threats and how you're going to buy things down. You do a lot more decisioning about the optionality of things. Um, but still, this is where you talk more about the whys. Um, yes, your board probably once a year wants to know about threats and you should brief them in on the state of the state once a year. They're probably also going to want to know how do we compare to our peers. They're probably also going to want to know uh, what are some emerging trends. Where are we compliant? Things like that. We can throw those things in, but there are two places to have these talks. There's the board deck and there's the book. The stuff you give them, the documents. All the technical details should be in the documents that you give them in advance. The deck, clean, simple, 15 minutes, in and out. When they ask you crazy questions, it's in the book. Straight from the Harvard Business Review, I was on a panel with a board director two weeks ago, and she echoed these same sentiments. What board directors want are for you to tell them in dollars the metrics, and they want third-party attestation. They want assurances that someone other than you has validated what you're saying. Those are the two big things that they want. So how do we do that? Well, we have to quantify our risk. Man, I'm so out of time. Um, it used to be super hard. It used to be impossible to do. It's not hard anymore. You can buy it as a tool. You just go out and buy risk quantification as a tool. You don't have to do Bayesian math and crazy confidence levels and stuff anymore. You can just go buy it as a tool. You still, however, have to have the conversation with your executives and your board about what is your risk appetite? What level of risk do you want to be taking on, right? Like zero risk is not true. Businesses are about risk. That's what businesses do. Like entrepreneurship is risk, right? So there is a level of risk you want. If you think about driving in your car, 70 is your target. Up to about 85, you're still cool. Over that, you're probably not cool. There's a place where they will just yank your license immediately. If you're doing below 45, that's risky too, right? Same thing in risk. Where is your target? 
Figure that out. Talk to your executive, talk to your board, figure out what your target is. And then when we're talking to them, we can tell them, hey, we have an annual exposure of $144 million a year. This is our minimum exposure, our maximum exposure. This is what our tolerance is. We want to be at about $54 million, which means we're over by $84 million. Our program, yep, I'm out of time. Our program uh, has a $4.5 million budget. It buys down our risk by $60 million. Look at this enormous return on investment you get. You still have exceedance. That's what we're treating next, right? What a great story. Like, look at this return on investment. This is how you get buy-in. This is how you explain the value of your program. And this is how you get buy-in for what you want to do next, right? Hey, you still have... Uh, $84 million that we need to treat, right? How do we want to treat it? Well, we have these 14 projects. They're going to cost $6.2 million. They're going to decrease our risk by $52 million. It's going to bring us down into our tolerance range. It's going to bring us up into compliance. This is the plan. We can show them in a dashboard. And this particular dashboard, if you want it, you can grab. I will share it with you in the slides. How we spend your money, what you got for it. Uh, what's your risk exposure versus the target? What it means to our business? Here's the external validation. Here's the plan. How we intend to invest your money? What you will get? How's it going? Here is the executive version of that. When you're speaking the language, one of the other tools you can go grab that you might love. Balance scorecard. This is a thing they're already doing. They already talk in this language. Balance scorecard is a thing that everybody learns in their MBA. Financial perspective, customer perspective, growth, operational. You can take those percentages that you couldn't turn into dollars and cents and jam them into the balance scorecard. Hey, uh, we're really great at turning in projects on time. We're really bad at M&A due diligence. We're really great at uh, uptime. We're really bad at protecting customer data in the terms you care about. Taking care of our customers, taking care of our finances. In the long version of this, there's a map on how exactly you do that. Here's an example of a bad one where uh, they missed, none of those are risks, and they said quantitative and then put qualitative metrics here on their regular green. Do and don't, super fast. Know what you're walking into. If you can, talk to all these people in advance. Go make friends with your CEO, go make friends with your CFO. These people are friendly, go be friends with them. Go meet your board members, find out who they are. They all have different backgrounds. They came from different places, they have different knowledge and they need different things. Go meet them and talk to them. Know in advance how much time you have, I missed. Um, ask the board how they, what they want, how they want the information presented, what they need. Be prepared, be professional, be concise, stay calm. Uh, when they ask you crazy questions, stay calm, stay on track, don't let them derail you. Um, you may be kept waiting, don't freak out, don't complain, don't lie, don't exaggerate, don't be boring, um, don't lobby, pitch, beg. Uh, Stay away from jargon, acronyms, stuff like that. They won't understand them a lot of the time. This is not a place to, you got to be careful when you say things that are political, like ESG and DEI and stuff are real big in boardrooms right now, but it's also a political third rail, so you got to be careful when you're talking about things. Don't be extra. There was a guy that I know, a legit actual CISO, who went and bought flowers for all of the female board members. Don't do that! Uh, and uh, be right, be brief, be gone. Get out. Don't overstay your welcome. Get out. They don't want you there. That's it. I'm going to do the same thing later. Go eat lunch.